All right, so we are back. We have a very special guest today, uh, hailing from the great state of Texas. He made a pilgrimage to Santa Barbara in the early 1980s that not only coincided with tectonic shifts in surfboard design and wave riding approach, led in part by Al Merrick at Channel Island Surfboards, but also coincided with the incubation and ascension of one Tom Curran. Uh, his new book, Shaping Surf History, beautifully documents this period with photographs and stories and is expected to hit bookshelves in early September. Jimmy Medico, thank you so much for joining us on the lineup today. Love being here. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> well, first things first, you know, where are you today and, and how, how are you doing? Uh, doing really well. I live outside of Austin um, and... This summer so far has been probably the hottest summer I've seen in my life. So mm. pretty hot right now. <laughs> it's been 105 to 108 for two months straight. So say what you will about global warming. It's hot outside. I think people are saying what they will about global warming, <laughs> myself included, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. I'll, you know, yeah, this I'll is stay really out exciting. of it, but it is hot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It's hot. Yeah. You know, this is really exciting for me. You know, I've been following you for such a long time on social media. And, and you and I, we got connected back when Tom was on the podcast, I think it was like episode 42 about some images. And then this book project came up and my God, everyone from Devin Howard to Jamie Brissick was just, you got to talk to Jimmy about this project. And I'm like, I'm already talking to Jimmy. And, and I'm, we're really excited about this book, cool. which yeah. I think is just a long way of saying, I think your project, Shaping Surf History, is one that a lot of people in the surfing world have been pretty excited about myself included. Wow. How does it feel for you kind of on the eve of, of its release? You know, as a creative, you put so much work into projects when, it, when it's finally done, it comes out, you're kind of exhausted. And then there's this next phase that kicks in where you have to go into it actually coming out and being released. And, and I'm just kind of coming out of that catching a breath phase and preparing for that. But I think once I get through this, kind of catch my breath phase. I think I'm going to be, it's going to be fun. I think the, what's really going to be fun about it is just sharing story with other people that love that era and love that time, time and love Tom and Channel Islands, Al Merrick, and just kind of sharing the experiences because I went through it just kind of as a, as this Grom who, I mean, I was 19 to 23, but Grom at heart for sure. And just experiencing all this stuff that was to this day is some of my most memorable moments. So the opportunity to share it both in book and personally going to all these book signing events is going to be uh, really what I look forward to the most. It's so cool. I mean, I went to school in Santa Barbara. I've lived oh, in Oxnard for 13 years um, and I wasn't quite born. Uh, I was born in 83, so it's a little bit after yeah, uh, this no, book right. uh, was chronicling. But I've been, everyone, I, I mowed through it this week and I'm talking to Britt Merrick, Pat O'Connell, everyone, I'm bringing it up. And I'm like, I am so nostalgic after reading this book for a time I wasn't directly involved in. It right. just seemed really magical. And, and you've got, you know, a forward written by, you know, fellow surfer and writer, Sam George. You got a last note from Tom Curran. You've got the you know, messages from Jamie Brissick. That was amazing Brissick. to get it's, a note from Tommy too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't talk to us about that. Cause, <laughs> cause I think it's so, I, I, what, I guess what I'm getting at, you just have this amazing, you know, uh, uh, group of people that are, are, contributing to this project and, and, and maybe give the listeners a little bit of background about why you decided to put this out and how it came together? Well, coincidentally, probably about 10 years ago, it was actually Jamie Brissick's brother. Uh, St I say Stevie, probably goes by Steve now. Um, I was just going back and forth with him on social, and he said, he goes, Jimmy, you got to put your photos out there. And I always knew I was going to circle back around at some point in my life uh, to this. And as I said earlier, it's by far one of the most exciting parts of my life was living through this. Uh, I grew up from seven years old, my first surf magazine, wanting to be a surfer. It turned into being a surf photographer. And I've just been, you know, like we said, a Grom ever since. And to have had this experience was incredible. And then to come back around at a point in my uh, life where I'm able to put the time into to do it correctly and share it has uh, probably kind of what kind of manifested 
itself into where we are now. And then uh, Jamie came along with some good uh, connections at Rizzoli, and then one thing kind of led to the other. He introduced me to a wonderful creative person by the name of Martinka, who is my editor there. And we just worked through it. Next thing you know, uh, it got accepted. The publisher, Charles Byers, got really behind the project and kind of saw it as being a just kind of little cool grassroots project. They deal with, I don't know, 60 books a season, uh, all kind of topics. And he found this one kind of unique and special and got behind it. And next thing you know, it's you know going to be released September 5th. So cool. And I'm going to try to walk a very fine line during this episode where we can talk about the project, but I don't want to cannibalize what's actually in it because I think anyone who is a surfer or a Tom Curran completist or is interested in board design or California surfing would do well to have this in their collection. It's, uh, it's right next to me right now. I consider it very special. But Yes, the, I agree with it, that. It, it, in reading about it, it just felt like none of it, and I want to get your read on this too, none of it at the time felt like it was intentional on your part. It felt like it was coming from a really pure place. And maybe intentional is not the right word, maybe manufactured is a better word, right? It is, you were a surfer, you ran into Tom Curran in Texas, you were a photographer, you're like, I'd like to come to the West Coast. You fell in with this group of people at this particular time, you followed your passion, and it just... It just felt like in reading it and experiencing it now through the book, the universe really lined up this this window of time for you. Is that how you look at yeah, it going no, you back? Yeah, no, you made me feel really was good. Was there actually a little bit more intention behind it? Uh, <laughs> right, okay, good. There was a little bit of intention, but you made me feel really good because uh, obviously what I was trying to communicate came across because we haven't talked about it prior to this. Uh, so that that's your firsthand take from it. That makes me feel really good, but that's... So I think the only intention was is I wanted to contribute to surfing, and I was a really mm. good surfer, but after watching Tommy and a couple of the pros, I realized I would never be that level. And what to me, what was the point? I think as a Grom, you want to be number one in the world. We say that to ourselves over and over again. We have posters on our wall. Um, we want to surf pipeline and win, just like Kelly Slater, and very few of us can. So... I had to figure out, okay, how am I going to contribute to the surf world? And I had this photographic background and I just, it just kind of came together. So when I went out to California, I was, my, my goal was to be a part of Surfer Magazine. And there were two magazines mainly, Surfer and Surfing, long before social media. Everything went through there. Everything went through the people that ran the magazine. And it was a very hard group to break into, and I was determined to break into that. The fact that I, I didn't even want to go to Santa Barbara. Uh, I didn't know much about it. Mm -hmm. I spent all my summer since I was 14 surfing North County, San Diego, that whole area. Never went as far as Malibu. Uh, and so I'm like, okay, I guess if my ticket out there is to go to Santa Barbara, I'm going to go. And, you know, what I kind of fell into was just pure dumb luck. I had no idea. I knew a little bit that there was Channel Islands. Obviously, I knew a little bit about Tommy. Uh, I, nobody knew anything about El Nino, and I knew about Rincon. Uh, but to have walked into this, you know, this stage just just being set, Sean Thompson just moving there, who was mine and everybody else's idol at that point. I right. mean, free ride and everything uh, was just was kind of hard to believe. And very quickly, within a year of being there, uh, not just me, but the whole group of people I was with, we we're all kind of pinching ourselves, kind of, is this really happening? There's even guys like Tommy, Sam, and Matt, uh, Willie, we all kind of, you know, relative to where that magazine, that surfer surfing, that Southern California, San Clemente, that area, that centric area where surfing it, uh, culture kind of came from, even where Sam and even Willie coming from the valley, we were kind of in these offbeaten paths. So being from Texas really mm -hmm. wasn't that much different. So we bonded right. over the fact that we were wanting to break into that culture, break into that mag world and that pro scene. I think that's a really interesting point because um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote Sam's uh, forward from your book. And, and he said, uh, you know, Jimmy, through his in imagery, inspired a sense of community seldom seen in modern surfing's decidedly insular culture, you know, and and... I think most surfers around the world understand that even subconsciously, right? And and I think what you're identifying is that 
the the time and the place that you slipped into, it wasn't, oh, everyone that surfs at this beach is third generation, dynastic, you know, rich superstar. It was it was people from different parts. You know, the George brothers came from the Central Coast and the Morris brothers came from the Valley and you came from Texas. And it was it, it, it does feel like the images you captured and the stories you captured at that time, it it was a lot more communal than I think a lot of people probably found in different areas of surfing then and probably to this day. Is that a fair assessment from your standpoint? Uh, absolutely. Um, mm. it, 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 plus, me coming from Texas, there, there was and is a surf culture. There was one at that time right. um, enough to have that passion grow. But it's it, nothing like California. So wanting to share that, mm. uh, not just with somebody you'd be out in the water with, but uh, you know their family members, their parents, all these these incidental people around the scene, you know, as part of a community uh, that supported everybody's goals in surfing was a big part of it. And I was really excited to be kind of photographing all of that and capturing all of it because you know I was like a kid in a candy store. I couldn't point my camera. At anything and not feel like I was getting something special, whether, you know, Rincon was six feet or flat. Right. Which and it, it was it does, flat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I've told this story on the podcast before, but, you know, it, everything's relative, right? So, like, growing up in Orange County, it's like, yeah, well, like, Santa Barbara is, that's Northern California, you know? And so, <laughs> when I went away to school, I'm like, I got a 610, I'll probably be using that at Rincon multiple times a week. And then you get up there and you learn about the geography and you're like, oh, okay. I was way off. Um, but just like that, 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 that sense of coming together is also something that's beautifully captured. And I want to get your take on this. It seems like Al and the Merrick family had a sense of community that was unique in surfing as well. It felt like they were really welcoming people into their home and trying to create something that, that hadn't existed before. No doubt. I, we were, we thought we were grown ups at that point, but looking back, we were a bunch of kids. And mm. we knew we were kids. But when you look at not just Al and Terry, but you look at Tommy's mom, you look at uh, Willie and Steve Morse's parents, the Morse's, you look at uh, Dana McCorkle's uh, parents, they were, they were kind of there. There's, there's a sense of, of, of family with them kind of being the grown-ups in a sense and not that any of them were really that much older than us they were still they were very young uh, relatively speaking they were kind of the older mature people and they were all such wonderful people good people community-based people that it, it kind of loosely formed a uh, community and mm. with all that said Channel Islands and Al and Terry were kind of the the pinnacle of all that they had the surf shop they had, you know, the the label, and then uh, they threw uh, these parties, these barbecues, quite often, which would be the only time we would all kind of get together socially or see each other away from the beach. And did I know that that was kind of like their plan at the time, or that they kind of? No, I was a kid, just kind of, you know, taking it all in firsthand, and you know, being very self-centered like we all were. But looking back, mm. absolutely, um, and and. A lot in the surfing world has talked about Al, but Terry was every bit just as, as a part of the success of Channel Islands. And, and uh, she was, as it's been said many times, mother to us all. And she worked the uh, mostly the uh, retail store. And um, another gentleman by the name of Kim Robinson, who was the manager at the mm -hmm. time, was another uh, you know older figure somewhat. Even though I say that, relatively speaking, none of these people are that much older, you know. It's just sure, at that yeah. time, it seemed like a lot, but absolutely to what you said. Yeah. You know, Pat O'Connell and I spoke for <laughs> probably a good, well over an hour about this the other day. And um, we got into it because we were kind of bemoaning the fact of, you know, how online we are and how busy we are and social media, this and, you know, outrage culture and polarization and everything. And I was talking about this book. I just finished it. And I, and I want to get your take on it because you were there and this is your book, but it, it does feel like this time period for a variety of reasons, there was so much more time and space and, and a version of that is just society and affordability and everything, but in culture, but just for kids 
to explore, for people to create. Um, and it's just reflected across it. You know, it's like there's all these characters in the book that's like, all right, we're going to get in the car. We're going to go to Northern California. We're going to look for waves. If we don't find them, look, we, we had an adventure. And, you know, with Al, it's like, I'm, I'm going to work on, you know, all these boards and I'm going to refine this model and we're going to work on this team. And, you know, Tommy, the same thing. It just felt like it was a very fertile time and environment for people to create and for really, I, I do think it's a contributing factor in those tectonic shifts, whether it was in board design or wave riding approach or, or Tom and his peers kind of ascension up the pro ranks. And, you know, Pat was like, yeah, absolutely. And he goes, it's not that you can't do that now. You just have to work so much harder to, to kind of um, box out the distractions and, 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 and all that. And, I, and I'm wondering if that's fair from your perspective, because you lived it and obviously you've, you've had a career after that. Was there just kind of an element of time and space that everyone was afforded to, to, to be themselves? As you, as you as you put it that way, yes, uh, that is a very accurate statement. Uh, I think a key element of everything is there there were dreams and aspirations, but there was no one hundred percent guarantee or expectation that any of it would go anywhere. And right. the, the professional surf world was very you know at its start, um, making a really good living within surfing was pretty much a pipe dream for for most people hmm. and the fuel that kind of fueled everything was just passion people were doing it because they loved it and things were simpler back then um, if you wanted to get in your car from Santa Barbara and drive to Rincon it literally was a 15 minute drive you can it could be an hour drive hmm. now uh, depending on time of day traffic sure. uh, you know um, you, you said okay I'm gonna go surf Hammonds and Hammond's any good, then you go surf Rincon, the next thing you know, you're in Ventura. It was all accessible, it was all easy to get to. Gas was $1.59 or maybe even not even a dollar yet. Uh, and right. it, everybody had the time, life was easy, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, social media did not exist, so everybody wasn't thinking along those terms. You were trying to put in these mass efforts to break into things. And that would take time, months, years, for, you know, to break into the magazines for me or to break into and get a sponsor. Now, you know, everybody, myself included, you put something out on social and you've achieved all that in, you know, with one post, <laughs> right. tech, you know, technically. Right. So I think that's kind of kind of maybe killed the, 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 the desire to get an instant, you know, response has kind of killed the, the effort that goes into doing things that we didn't even think about last, you know, back then. Does that make sense? Am yeah. I saying? Uh, no, 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 absolutely. And I, I appreciate that insight. Um, you know, two, two more points before we, we go into break here, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, the book is fantastic. Your relationship with Tom felt like it became particularly close and, and Tom is, as it stands in 2023, this larger than life mythical figure in surfing and, and, and whether accurate or not is kind of has the, the mystique about him that he doesn't like to film. He doesn't like to be photographed. He does, you know, he, he, he prefers just to be a surfer, a surfer, but it really felt like over the course of those four years of your time in the area and working with Tom, he trusted you implicitly to the point where he would say, I don't want to film today, but that didn't mean you. You know, and, and can you talk a little bit about the Tom Curran mythology versus your experience with him, probably just on a human level? <laughs> so, um, back then we were we were kids, and we all just loved surfing. Everybody loved surfing. At at at, at the crux of everything of all your podcast of of every social media site we go through, it's it's all about surfing. And that passion uh, about just going surfing uh, was what guided us. And friendships, not just with Tom, but with everybody, was built around. And when when your your desires align, me wanting to get photographs, Tommy wanting to have access to waves before he had a car, and his mother uh, 
his mother took him everywhere. His mother on the weekends took him all the contests. Um, and then when I came along, I was able to, to, at a point in time, we were able to go hit wherever after school. And uh, when there wasn't a contest on the weekend, we may end up going to Cayucas or we may end up going down as far as Malibu mm-hmm. and, and or Zuma, uh, what have you. And we did it all in the moment's notice without a lot of forethought, just where were the waves? Um, and I think that's the essence of, of Tom is he just loves surfing. He's passionate about it. Mm-hmm. And I look at a lot of different people that I know or know of and how they do being a pro surfer. And there's no right or wrong way. Um, um, and each one is kind of admirable in their own way. And why I might admire a Willie Morris or a Kelly Slater mm-hmm. or a Mick Fanning or a Tommy Curran may not all be the same way. And sure. the reason I admire Tommy is because nothing has gotten in the way of Tommy just doing what every surfer wants to do, and that's go surfing. And um, he's managed to do that uh more than most of us because of his, his pure, you know, uh, talent and, uh, and focus. And another thing to what you're addressing as far as mystique, um, mm. that creates mystique, but there's, I think you were talking about when you, before you moved to Santa Barbara, it's, you didn't quite understand it. I think to this day, there's still kind of mystique about Santa Barbara and coming from Santa Barbara. There's, you kind of, leave when you kind of leave LA and you go through the Camarillo Valley and you come into Ventura, then there's a whole part of 101 where it's just cliffs and highway. It's, it's almost like you're going through this, this, this portal into the Santa Barbara and, and the first thing you hit is Rincon. And then from that point on, if, if you've never been there before, you don't realize there's a million right points, you know, all the way right. through, you know, to, to the, um, point conception, uh, and it's just mystical and it rarely is good, you know, so that makes it even more, you know, of a, a myth, you know, these days that <laughs> sure. people talk about that happened 10 years ago. And you look at the point and you go, you can see, how, you know, it's not like you're on a lake where it can never have a wave. You're looking at somewhere that could, but you're looking at it as flat as a lake most of the time. Uh, so I think Tommy, Al, everybody kind of uh, gets that, you know, that feeling of, of mystique from just being from Santa Barbara. Does that make sense? sense. Absolutely. You know, I, I would be remiss of me not to mention this, you know, having worked at the ASPW cell for 18 years and uh, there's a wonderful part of the book um, where you're, you're covering, you know, Tom as he's kind of moving up through the pro ranks and there is a picture of Wayne rabbit Bartholomew uh, gnawing off the logo <laughs> of the contest board shorts because yeah. it conflicted with his own personal sponsor and as rabbit hired me he was the president at the time and as the uh, former asp president and uh, architect of the the dream tour um watching him gnaw off the event sponsor in favor of his own personal fortune i felt was a perfect uh microcosm of <laughs> professional surfing in a lot well, of ways you know the bug uh, bunny logo Absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, the whole like the whole that was that was kind of a classic thing. And I remember that like it was yesterday. Uh, <laughs> they were, you know, the sponsorship conflicts with the, the event sponsor and who they were sponsored by at this very beginning stage of professional surfing, uh, you know, was quite a, you know, episode at that time. And uh, I remember later, I don't know if it was after the contest, walking down the beach in Malibu and there were those pair of shorts you know, just discarded. And I almost went back and picked them up, you know, like these are going to be, you know, these could be valuable. So now I go, no, that's somebody's shorts. I'm not going to go around picking up somebody's shorts out of the ground, but that would have been a, a, a neat piece to have, you know, for a museum at some point, you know, along with the photo. But yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting statement on how far everything has come, but that, 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 or, or not, you know, or not, it's yeah, well, yeah. similar, right? Yeah. Well, you still well, can, man, you know, but, go ahead. No, please. No, no, you go. Well, you know, the surf world, everybody tries to compare today to yesterday. And what what exists today is the same thing existed yesterday. Is that is you can make surfing anything you want. I just think there's been more people who have taken things to fruition in all these different directions in surfing mm-hmm. now. And it's a lot more to get your head around. But basically that existed back in the day. 
and the magazines focused on what they felt was their interpretation of the culture, but the, just about everything that exists today existed back then, uh, just in a more manifested, you know, form of it. And you can still today go out and have surfing be whatever you want it to be. And uh, so to me, it's every bit as exciting as it's ever been from that perspective. I think that's fair. I, I oft, I think that's totally fair. I mean, even especially this year, I often get people be like, man, must be crazy at the WSL. And I'm like, it's always been crazy. Like <laughs> as far as, no, as long the, as the, I've been here. I, I um, think the WSL yeah. and, and the events to me, I, I find them incredibly exciting. I, you know, it's, it's, is it like it was back in, in 1980, 1981? No, but in 1980, like I have some photos of the Malibu pro in 1980, that was like an amateur contest. It, it, except for everybody right. was a surf star. Well, you can still go to an amateur contest. You can still experience the exact same, you know, type of, of, of event. Um, mm. And so it all exists now. Uh, and, but you have this really exciting platform, the WSL, of how it is now. And uh, the competitiveness in the, in the, uh, the, the, you know, for example, watching events anywhere in the world on your computer, we would have dreamed to have that. It's, sure. it's I was talking um, with Miguel before, and we were talking about digital versus film, and I get guys coming up to me, younger guys all the time, what was it like shooting film back then? You know, I said, well, shooting film back then was exciting because that's all you knew. You had the support system, you had Kodak, you had everywhere to drop your film off, you had plenty of places to buy your film. It's kind of hard right now to do it. And they go, well, right. don't you want to shoot film today? I said, you know, what I really, if, if out of all these scenarios, I think an exciting scenario would be not to shoot film today, but to go back in time with the only digital camera. That would have been right. exciting <laughs> because that would have solved every problem you had with film. And, you know, we can kind of do that nowadays. We can kind of do whatever we want and, and have all these things to our access. So to me, it's exciting, you know, and you just For focus sure. on yeah. what you like. Yeah. I mean, I remember when we just got the live scoring, I think I was like 20 or something. And I thought that was awesome. I'm like, wow. All right. It's like, it's like I'm watching the event. There's no image. There was no audio. It was just these little score buttons that were like, so-and-so got this score. And you're like, wow. Did you see the one photo I had of, of rabbit where, um, they were doing, one guy was doing a focus check on me. Rabbit was sitting there waiting to be interviewed and all those wires were in the dirt. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I always want if somebody, anybody from from that that has to do with any kind of uh, a casting from WSL is wondering what you know their take on that would be. Because now you it's these sophisticated rooms that you know are <laughs> that could be you know somewhere in LA and they're you know on a right right you know scaffolding and you know on a reef somewhere you know and they look yeah. as sophisticated as anything you'd find in a studio in LA. For sure. Well, before we get to the next segment, you know, Shaping Surf History, it's coming out very, very soon. You got a couple events coming up. There's the Channel Islands, uh, Channel Islands book launch and signing party at the Harbor Store. That's on September 6th. Uh, and that's where it all began curl. for me. Oh, right. That's where it all began. Store. Yep. Yeah. So that's that's a real personal event. Uh-huh appropriate to, to start the signings there. And then you've got the uh, Rip Curl book signing and, and Q&A with Tom, uh, Sam, George uh, as the, the moderator at the Rip Curl store in San Clemente on September 7th. I will be sure to be there. Uh, boardroom show, booth, book signing, Q&A with Tom and moderated by Jamie Brissick on October 7th and 8th. Uh, Pilgrim Surf and Supply in Brooklyn uh, with a slideshow uh, moderated by Jamie Brissick on October 26th. And then Cruise Control in uh, Cambria book signing dates and details to be announced and a few more. So if anyone listening wants to check this out in person, uh, talk to Jimmy, talk to the folks uh, involved in the project, be sure to check it out. We are going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. All right, we are back with the lineup. I'm Dave Prodan here with Jimmy Medico. Uh, We laughed about this, but photographer and author of Shaping Surf History. But, you know, Jimmy, um, you come from Texas. You are a surfer from Texas. You are a photographer from Texas. Can you give us a little bit of background about what your upbringing was like, how you you came to surfing? Uh, I... I'm from and was raised in Houston, Texas, and that's about an hour from the coast. 
And when I was seven, my parents bought a second home down on the right on the water in Galveston on what's called West Beach. And uh, we had to go there every weekend and we had to go all summer long. And it was either find something to do or hate life. And uh, I have four older brothers and one brother just above me decided to hate life and stay indoors and wish he was back in Houston. And I was always uh, loved the water always swam, always wanted to be outdoors, and I took full advantage of it. And um, my one of my older brothers surfed in the 60s, and he had a couple of his old uh, lawn boards hanging around, so we started taking those out, so pretty much right away. So the, the first time I stood up on the board, I was a regular foot. The second time, I was a goofy foot. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about six-inch whitewater waves, um, but I was hooked from that point on. Uh, I made my parents take me to uh, the grocery store where they had a magazine rack and I got my first surf magazine and from that point on that's all I ever talked about and my parents were so excited that at least one of their kids that their younger two were was occupied while they were there at the beach and uh, and then you know growing up in Texas at some point they say okay well when are you gonna get a real job and when are you going to, you know, start taking life serious? And uh, to me, it was about, okay, how can I get involved in the surf world? And that was very foreign to most people and where I came from. And I have a photo of um, the late Dave and Chris Brown paddling out uh, when Chris was just maybe nine or 10 years old and his dad was mm. uh, taking him out. Right. It's in the book. And I turned around and shot that shot because here was a father pushing his uh, son towards the ocean, towards the waves. Whereas uh, where I grew up, every parents did everything they could to push you away and become responsible adults uh, in the work world. And I fought that and uh, my father finally saw that, you know, it was futile for him to not, you know, uh, to kind of go along supporting me. So he turned 180 degrees and started supporting me. And I ended up uh, out in Santa Barbara at Brooks, uh, mm -hmm. having already at 19, already been surfing for 12 years and uh, still, and I have always considered myself a surfer. I just, uh, you know, it's more of a personal thing rather than a profile thing and right. uh, kind of enjoyed being a surfer and a surf photographer. Um, when I go shoot, I have uh, no desire to surf because I'm probably usually shooting something pretty exciting that uh, makes up for us. It's a vicarious experience. Uh, the waves are, uh, there's just enough waves in Texas to get uh, into the sport, but never to satisfy you by any means. And so the mm -hmm. magazines back then, surf movies now, uh, travel, everything is, is what kind of keeps you going. And um, having the magazines be such a big part of my time Growing up being a surfer, um, they were just everything. So wanting to contribute and be a part of those magazines somehow, some way was seemed like the ultimate, you know, goal for me. So when I did finally move out to California, it was to be a photographer for Surf Magazine. And I told everybody that, and everybody's like, "Yeah, sure, Jimmy. You know, whatever you say. You know." But I just was relentless. And then, as we said earlier in the conversation, uh, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Hmm. and uh, it's had the subject matter. It, it's interesting because this is a theme that comes up on our podcast quite a lot, often with like CT surfers, because they, they you know, to generalize, they kind of fall into two buckets. You know, they come from, you know, again, third generation surfer, like dad was a professional surfer or shaper, ton of waves, and, and they just got very, very good from a very young age. And then the other bucket, and this, I'm talking elite level surfers, is they don't come from that situation. Oftentimes they come from the opposite. You know, it's been said about, you know, Kelly Slater and the Hobgoods and Caroline Marks is they're all amazing big wave surfers, you know, Chopu, Pipeline, but they come from Florida and it's like, they've got really nothing like that, that, that helped them develop into surfers. But you, know, you talk to them or you talk to the people around them and they're like, the absence of all that made them so hungry and dedicated and driven to, to become who they became. And it sounds like there is an element of that for folks from Texas. I mean, there's another surf photographer, John Steele comes mm -hmm. from Texas, you know, the WSL zone, Milby Shannon, you know, 
sometimes that that drive really does propel you into seeking something out that you maybe wouldn't have otherwise if it was so readily available. There's there's no doubt about that. Now Texas has it mm. produced multiple world champions, like Florida has. There's something else going on. <laughs> sure, <Florida>. yeah. <laughs> you know, Cocoa Beach right. has. There's a know, lot of things going on in Florida. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something in the water there for sure. Uh, is it, it's you know back to Jeff Crawford and you know uh, the connection right, of yeah. Florida and Pipeline is is uh, Matt Keckley. You know. Uh, Yep. It goes on and on. There have been a couple of guys from uh, that have done really well in Hawaii, but they've never gone to that next level um, of you know making a career out of it. Uh, uh, but there is. It's it's like anything. It's like creativity comes from the lack of you know. And mm. and um, uh, one interesting thing: the, the guys that I know that have done really well. Um, whatever their background was that have done really well in surfing have usually done that with a lot of support from their family. Uh, right. you, know, you look at Tommy and, uh, uh, his mother, Janine, um, you know, would Tommy be Tommy if it wasn't for her, for her dedication, mm. uh, driving him everywhere, um, uh, making sure that he made contests, uh, not just in California, but in Texas, you know, Basically, right. she she put everybody in the car and drove to Texas. What the very first time that I saw him surf in in the summer of '79 for a U.S. championship, um, you know, it's the parental support. No matter what the background is, whether the parents were pro surfers themselves, or it was a surf family, or there's a foreign to surfing as my parents were. Uh, at some point, the parental support has to be there. There's a lot of really good surfers that I know that could have been world champions, but at some point, they fell mm -hmm. to the wayside because they didn't have that support, and and it gets in your head, and it got right. into my head a little bit, a lot, you know, too. Is you're constantly, you're young, and you don't have your, your, you don't understand yourself well enough. So these things that other people are saying that are probably true, uh, you can't. It, it takes a while to kind of put it into perspective how you're going to make that work for you. And uh, I, I have specific reasons that I left California at. At that time, when I, after the after eighty three, uh, but sure. the reason I probably didn't come back after that kind of played out was probably because uh, I, I still had that in me that I felt like I had to do this established route, and it's probably taken right. most of my life to kind of come back around and say, you know, no, this is who I want to be. You know, it's it's a tough thing. It's interesting, you know, I. I I really resonated with your story of seeing Tom for the first time because you yourself were a competitive surfer. And, um, you know, I, I competed when I was younger, competed in college and I was never any good, but would get through heats and kind of drank the Kool-Aid on like, yeah, like, I mean, if I'm getting through heats and Andy Irons is getting through heats, I mean, it's, we all understand the same formula here. Just my right. thinking back then. And then, uh, and then I remember, uh, uh, starting with the ASP and traveling and then s like really seeing the level of surfing in the flesh and thinking for the very first time, whatever they do, I I'm not do like whatever they're doing is not what I'm doing. I don't think I surf anymore because of that. Now, obviously that's a non-nuanced approach, but there was a moment where I go, whoa, the, the, the realization is set in for me. And I'm very fortunate to, to still have had the life I had, but it sounds like you had a similar moment in seeing Tom surf for the first time i didn't i did not even decided. go out in my heat in the okay. contest after seeing him i <laughs> <laughs> i just I, I just said that's it you know what's the point you know uh yeah. it, he just took our waves and surfed them at such a different level as you know right. and you kind of look at it this way on your if you surfed every day if you got your timing down just perfect if you were the best surfer you knew you could be uh, if you got all those inconsistencies out of your game and and uh, could could do two foot, eighteen feet, whatever size you could go out and be confident in, and and call yourself and come out of the water and have everybody goes, wow, you were good, you know, you still in the back of your mind know that on these guys like Tommy and Kelly and and Andy and and the Brazilians on their best days. Um, Excuse me. On their worst days, they're still better than you. It's kind of, oh. it's you know, it's, it, in a competitive arena, that's you already know, you already have the answer. You know, what are you competing for? 
you know, it's so it's a personal thing. Why would I compete yeah. when I already know I've lost, you know, in a sense. Now, some people just love competing and sure. Yeah. It, it, but to me, it was always about you want to be the best at something. So I just kind of turned that into, you know, uh, photography. But yeah, no, it's 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 at the same time, it's a really cool thing. You know, your surf heroes are somebody that can surf better than you. You know, you have very mm. few surf heroes that are like worse surfers than you. Uh, and so there are some, there's some, there's this one ride I talk about in the book of Willie Morse at Super Tubes that I remember seeing mm. after seeing that ride, I was just like, you know, he's actually younger than me. I was like, that mm. guy's my, he's my new surf hero. You know, never in a million right. years could I have ridden that wave and and yeah. maintain that, that, that thin line of uh, that you have to draw at such a wave like that on such a day. Yeah. I appreciated what you said before, um, breaking down how you felt as a surfer, not surfing uh, often on really, really good days or really special days and shooting in set instead, because I think, you know, for myself and I think for a lot of surfers out there, that's always a question where it's like, man, how do photographers and filmers, how do they do that? You know, like if they're surfers, like how do they, how do they compartmentalize and go, Yep, today I'm I'm shooting, and then I'll surf a different time. And it I I've always felt like it takes a pretty zen like approach, especially when you're young and you don't have all the other responsibilities going on of like right, right. you know kids and a mortgage and whatever. It's like, did that ever was that ever a struggle for you where you're like, I really wish I was surfing today, but I'm shooting instead. No, because because what I was shooting was so good. Uh, it's right. like it's like in nineteen. 19- 79 scene uh, whenever free ride came out uh i think maybe mm. it was 77 but you know the movies they recycled and in watching being in the front row seat at a surf movie and sean thompson pulling it off the wall dan merkel filming you know this incredible water photography where he goes by you and then he's underwater and you see the fins go underwater and then a year later shooting sean from the water and having him go by you mm. the same way as if you're in this front seat of a movie uh, movie theater watching Free Ride, it's just yeah. it's an incredible feeling that you, it, surfing. We all love to watch surfing. Uh, we all when we I mean that's why we do it so much. It, when you when you watch on social media, when you watch a movie, what have you, uh, you love watching surfing, and you vicariously put yourself in that situation. And then when you're at at the time, I was shooting some of the best surfers in the world. So you're actually mm. surfing, doing vicariously the best surfing in the world. And so right. it, it's, could I have surfed those waves and had fun and got, you know, barreled on some incredible days? Sure. But I never could have surfed at the level that I was vicariously experiencing while shooting, especially when you're from mm. the water. It's an interesting way to think about it because um, I've, I've had to answer similarly, but in a different way about mostly like your, my career, because I've been here for so long. And like, why don't you go do something else? It's like, well, there are a lot of reasons, but I land in a similar space where I'm like, there's very few professions and where you get to experience, not to put too much sugar on it, but like human transcendence in a way, like we get to watch these incredible humans at this incredible moment, do these incredible things and I, I don't know, like, I feel like that is a currency that, that elevates above a lot of other experiences in a way, because we could probably be doing a lot of different things if we wanted. But I think what you're, you're articulating better than me, but like being able to tap into those moments where I'm like, I, I am not only witnessing something, I, I'm capturing something that has never been done before and won't ever happen again in this way. And, and that's pretty special. Absolutely. Um you do feel like you're, is it ephemeral or I get the two, it's ephemeral. Mm, yeah, that's yeah, like it's, temporary, it's, right? Like, I'm, yeah. Right. Um, uh, that nature, I think, is, is always been kind of the, the, the hook in surfing is that good days, you know, come and go. And if you're not there at that moment, you've missed it and you have to wait forever. Uh, Right. Photography moments are just like that. You have to, even today with, with equipment, digital equipment being the way it is today, you still have to wait for the waves. You still have to wait for the right wind conditions, the right sun angle, the uh, the right tide. Uh, 
you know, Santa Barbara. I caught some insane days this last uh, January. Uh, you know, phenomenal stuff. But still, there was so much silt coming out of the rivers, it wasn't that beautiful green. It, you know, so right, when, yeah. when everything lines up perfectly and you get it all come together, it's 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 like finding a, a you know, it's it's very much like what you would think about the other side of a rainbow, finding that, you know, pot of gold. I mean, that's what you're... Right. It's a treasure hunt. Uh, shooting uh, a lot of photography, not just surfing, is a treasure hunt. Looking, f especially when you shoot outdoors. Studio photography is, right. is way different. You control the environment, um, but anything to do with outdoors, whether you're kayaking, hiking, surfing, shooting, uh, you're just looking for those peak moments. And when you get them, you just really feel like you've you've you know, you're a part of something special that all those people sitting back, not doing stuff, not going outdoors, sitting at the computer are not experiencing. And you feel very lucky because of it. Uh, and being around mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, is, is invigorating in so many different ways. It's life, you know, inspiring for sure. I loved in your book, Shaping Surf History, the stories you had about working with, I mean, there were two magazines at the time in the States, right? There was Surfing and Surfer. And it it felt like the simplicity of that compared to today, there was like a really strong center of gravity in surfing of things that mattered, right? Where the zeitgeist or the culture or the narrative was captured in these few spots, you know, compared to day where it's, you know, stratified across a bunch of different mediums and, and there's a bunch of different kind of, um, you know, opinions on what matters and what doesn't. And, you know, I, I just love the stories of, of you writing in and, and sending in, you know, your, your material to the photo editors like Art Brewer and then Jeff Devine at Surfer and then Larry Flame Moore at Surfing. It really it really hit home just how larger than life and important those figures were at the time and, and, and probably still would be today if the medium hadn't shifted so much. And today people probably couldn't name the photo editor at most surf mags of the ones well, that are I, left. I think one of the best photographers and photo editors ever is, is Grant Ellis. And, yeah. and yeah. he's probably been a photo editor as long or longer than the other guys. Sure. Uh, but he wasn't he he came just at the end of that era and uh but it's not it's not his skills not his talent he's phenomenal uh he's he's one of the best shooters out there uh yeah but he wasn't part of that era where it's kind of like uh you know uh local sports newscasters you know when they used to be local heroes um, you know, the, the Ron Burgundy thing, um, you know, and now, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. nobody, you know, they're, they're not, that's, you know, everybody's their own photo editor. I'm my own photo editor to my own Instagram site, you know, so on and so forth. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah no, it was, it, it was, it was, it was special because it gave you something to focus on and it gave you people to look up to. And it really meant something to win over you know, uh, Larry or Jeff or, you know, uh, Art Brewer, yep. um, you know, to have them all of a sudden say, okay, you know, I need you, you know, when you're, when before all you got was, you know, form reject letters, it's just like, you need me, right. you know, it's like you're being called up to the major leagues. It's, it's like, it's like everything you ever wanted and, and you couldn't be more excited. You, you know, at some point down the road, you're going to have, you know, uh, a thousand images published, but never, nothing's ever like that first time where you get that acknowledgement from those guys. It was pretty <laughs> Jeff Devine. And, and when I got that postcard that's in the book from Mark Brewer, I was like going around, I had it in my back pocket. I was showing it to everybody and, you know, look, 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 you know? Um, yeah, no, I don't know if that exists anymore. That's a good question. It's a good question. I remember uh, when I was an intern in 2005 at the ASP, I got an email from Al Hunt and I was showing it to all my friends, bragging, basically be like, I'll hunt, you know, wrote me an email. It's larger than life guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's a good question. I don't think anyone does that with my emails today. I'll put it out. Yeah, the, exactly. um, no, not you, you but know, I'm thinking about me. <laughs> Nobody ever does that with anything. Right, right. <laughs> I know. Yeah, no, um, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it, it ended with an era and it's not, you know, nostalgia is good up to a point, uh, you know, um, mm. Yeah, and I love nostalgia, and and I I love the textural feeling of of 
a lot of the stuff in the past, but but only as it, as it how it pertains to moving forward and what excites you about right. moving forward. You know, it's it's a it's a way to learn and 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 to enjoy. But but how does it imply moving forward? And there's so many exciting things moving forward. Uh, uh, that that one thing I like about the project, the shaping surf history, is that uh, it, it gives you a little grounding. You know, uh, mm. we, we, we've moved forward so fast. The surf industry just took off exponentially. The future shock of it all, where the rate of, of, of change happens so quick that it's kind of fun to just stop for a second and look back and kind of see where we came from so we can better stop and look at what we're doing today and enjoy some things that we might be missing. You know, yeah. the, the moments that, no, 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 I got to go in. I got to I got to go uh, post this. You know, no, just sit here for right. a minute. Enjoy the moment. Yeah. Worry about posting later. You know, uh, enjoy the sunset. Whatever, it, whatever it be. Enjoy hanging out with your buddies and and you know sitting on that log watching the last set come through. You know, don't rush off and 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 do whatever you got to do because everything has to be uh, you know so expedient now. Uh, I think yeah. I, that's one thing I hope that the book does. It kind of like brings people, slows them down to kind of enjoy the moment, be in the moment a little more. If that I think that's sense. a great insight. A little no, corny, totally, but, right? Know. No, no, no. I think that's such a good take on nostalgia too, because I think we can all get caught in the like, I only want to live in the past because I preferred it back then or whatever. No, but, no, we all you know, know people uh, like that, and you know, yeah, I, who, who, I've been that person in the before, you know, but I, and we've all I been that person, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like progress isn't a straight line though, right? Like sometimes, you know, humanity or your own personal track, it ends up in a cul-de-sac and it's like, you can turn around and come back out. And I think something like shaping surf history gives us those little kernels of like, this was really special. And, and, and this component of life or of surfing is probably eternal. And we can take that into modern times. Exactly. We don't, yeah. we don't have to take everything. With yeah. You're us. saying you it know, better you, than I did, but that's exactly what, no, I, mean. exactly, <laughs> that's no, exactly I, what I meant. <laughs> You were you were a student of of the Brooks Institute of mm -hmm. Photography, and at the same time, you were you were chronicling all this mm -hmm. work. Um, probably part of it was academic based, but a lot of it was just professional. And we certainly have a lot of creatives that listen to the podcast, and you know whether they're journalists or filmers or editors or artists or um, photographers. Um, how, how do you look back on that balance between academic training in the creative field and then real world, just professional experience shaping who you were? And I guess another question on that is, could you have done with one or the other or, or did both things kind of sharpen you into who you ended up being? Um, so my father was, was an engineer by trade um, hmm. and then was a successful businessman. And my mom was an artist. Uh, my mom was uh, French. My dad was German. Um, they're both ancestry, not from there. And uh, so you had this very creative person and you had this very uh, left brain logical person. And uh, that's kind of, you know, in me. And I, my mom, even, even as the more creative uh, liberal side of the, the parental uh, influence, She'd always said that every great artist, uh, they master their craft. They learn how to do things perfectly, mm -hmm. mastering it before they go out and experiment and be creative. And so that's kind of mm -hmm. how I looked at, at Brooks is, is technically learning how to do everything. Uh, I was, I was uh, technically lazy quite often. Uh, I, I <laughs> did things that uh, and shot images that I wasn't paying attention to exposure perfectly and I paid for it afterwards uh, but I knew that I had to understand it well enough uh, in order to master the craft so I go out and do what I want and I think that involves uh, pretty much with with any kind of creativity it does not mean that you can't go explore and be creative and, and not mm. worry about all the structure and the technical stuff but I think it, I think if you're capable if you have the opportunity to do both at the same time from my perspective, you're better off. I look at some of the best photographers I know, uh, and some of them are, are um, some of the best guys in LA are actually out of uh, out of the surf world, like somebody like Steven Lippman and stuff. If you look at his the quality right, yeah. of his work and what he does, uh, how he got his technical proficiency, I'm not sure. 
uh, whether he was self-taught right. or not, but it's there and it's incredible. And that allows him to go and do things that somebody just being creative without the technical skill would have a hard time doing. Um, so right. I think you need both, but it doesn't mean that mm. one is going to control you. You have to make that decision right. for yourself. Is that answering your question? hundred percent. And okay. I think, I think the listeners really appreciate that insight. You know, um, a last question before we, we take one more break. We kind of hinted at the, the cosmic confluence of events that lined up with this period really of your was, life, yeah. you know. Um, we talked about Tom and the George brothers, the Morris brothers. We talked about this area of California. It, it coincided with some some very good wave seasons, you know, El Nino seasons. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it also coincided with this real shift in surfboard design between the twin fin and the thruster, the thruster that was uh, invented by Australian Simon Anderson, but Simon and Al Merrick at Channel Islands really worked closely together to dial in the Channel Islands thruster, which to this day is, is probably a model that is mostly used by most high performance surfers on the planet. Did you have any awareness in the moment, being both a surfer and a chronicler of the surfing at the time, that things were just radically shifting because of because of Al's kind of innovations. I remember once that uh, we all played tennis. I grew up playing tennis, and uh, and Kim Robinson, the manager, Al, Sam, and Matt, Davy Smith, uh, Tommy. We all played tennis uh, as when when there weren't waves. And I remember being at I forgot what the public uh, courts were in Santa Barbara, and it was it was. Al, Sam George, Matt George, myself, and we were, we were just kind of rallying, uh, hitting the ball back and forth, and we were all kind of, you know, being lazy, and we kind of finished a rally, and we were standing by the uh, net, and Sam just goes, he just goes, can you believe kind of what Jimmy has walked into, you know, just as, <laughs> as in, you know, so we were conscious of it, I was certainly conscious of it, how all this was coming together, and you would have to ask Al how he saw it. From from my perspective, as as a surfer, the the seventies since the shortboard revolution was a constantly. You grew up constantly. What's next? You know the twin mm -hmm. fin. The uh, you know even tails. You know swallowtail versus rounded pin versus diamond, and then. Um, the the fish and then you get into the shorter boards the less down the line boards that started to happen in the uh in the later part of the 70s uh, and some of the most beautiful you know single fin outlines for high performance short boards were the boards being written in the in the early 80s like rabbit's board at the malibu pro i i tried to make sure an image of that board was in there um mm. and so there was kind of this thing where the, it was between the single fin and the twin fin, and then the thruster comes. And I remember the, you know, when, like I like I was didn't finish, but you'd have to ask Al how he saw that coming and, and what that s scenario is. I can remember when I first saw the thruster, somebody was paddling out. Uh, we were surfing this beach break that's on the backside of Rincon. Uh, that's just kind of a summer beach break. Uh, it's a closeout when there's a real swell in the winter time, and this guy paddles out uh, with the Almeric uh, thruster. And at that time, Tommy was still on a twin fin. Uh, mm. I was like, what's that? And there was kind of this attitude, oh, one, two, three, well, why not four, five, six? You know, the, it really wasn't right, understood yeah, yeah. as a thruster. It was just, okay, you're adding another fin. You know, it's, it's like, is this for real? And I, I think at that point in time, there was no way of knowing that it was really going to become. And then slowly over the course of six months, Tommy got, I think it was around the summer of 82, Tommy got on a thruster. And I remember the first time, the first board he shot, we, it was a real, it was in the spring, I think. And it was a real small day. And we went to this place uh, that would take windswells well, that's no longer a spot anymore. It was called Oil Piers. It's right around where Stanley's Diner used to be. And the, the piers are gone. But it, it really uh, was was good for little like four foot windswell days in the afternoon. And I photographed and uh, Tommy surfing the first thruster. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, that's just another board. Uh, but if you look back at my photos and you look at Tommy's turns uh, from his bottom turn to his off the top and you compare 
what he was doing on the twin fin to just a month of on that thruster, it the, it just everything you could see in the photos how it just changed, just from square bottom turns to square vertical off the tops, and just uh, you know where he would slam it and do his look back. He wasn't doing that really on the twin fin. The twin fin was more of just beautiful, smooth connecting maneuvers, being able to go anywhere you want. Uh, yeah, there were some big moves, but nothing. The thruster was just big move to big move. And in the way Tommy put it together with his form and style uh, uh, in, in continual one big maneuver to the next. Uh, is that answering the question? A hundred percent. And, and I got no, lost no, no. in the memory a little bit and forgot no, the question. <laughs> I that was a perfect answer, but I it did you, you did uh, no good deed goes unpunished. I'm going to ask one more before we get a break because yeah. it's uh, your answer led me to to think of this. In your opinion, uh, with Tom surfing, you know, someone who started on a single fin became very very good on a twin fin, and then you know, hit a sort of surfing singularity on, on the thruster. Mm -hmm. Do you think if Tom had started on a thruster, would that, do you think he would have ended up in the same place or do you think he would have ended up in a better or, or I, I hesitate to say worse, but I guess my question is, do you think that his development on a single fin and twin fin? Well, did Andy Iron start on a twin fin? I don't mm, think Andy point. Iron started on a twin fin, right? I wouldn't know. Yeah, probably not. Uh, and, and but they're different surfers too, right? Like they're, you know, but I, different kind of approach. Yeah, but they're both like extremely like, elite level. Yeah, elite no, it's a it's a great point. Talent, it's a great and point. I think that you would you would you would overcome anything. But I'll, I'll tell you this: I think anybody that doesn't start out at at at, at their beginning point on a nine foot longboard how they become a good surfer always amazes me is I think that foundation mm. of, of a, of a nine foot board and, and, and then my air going through single fins in the twin fins, yep. in the thruster, I think that that develops flow and style. And so when someone mm. starts surfing on a thruster and they have that natural flow and style, I'm always amazed. Right. Uh, you know, at, where did that come from? Because I feel a lot of, of my form and style came from the boards that I rode and the evolution I went through. Does that make sense? I think that's right. I think that's yeah, what but, I was going after for all the and, uh, and so the yeah, maybe Tommy would have out here for their kids. <laughs> yeah, maybe he would have surfed differently, or but he still would have been phenomenal, without doubt. I love yeah. it. We're going to take one more quick break, and we will be right back. All right, we're back. This is The Lineup. I'm Dave Prodan here with Jimmy Medico. Uh, we're talking about his book, Shaping Surf History. You know, Jimmy, the book chronicles a very, very important time, not just in California surf history, but global surf history. And in reading it and, 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 and absorbing it, one would be forgiven if they thought this is like decades of human evolution and achievement, but it was four very focused years of, you know, 1980 through 1983. You left the area um, after 1983. In, in a way, you, you left what some people probably considered sort of surfing's Shangri-La. Um, what were the circumstances behind that decision? Um, so, uh, my father had had uh, esophagus cancer and was uh, mm. being treated for that. And I, I was right when I was coming towards the end of uh, uh, my time at Brooks, uh, going to school at Brooks. Uh, I, I was balancing the decision of what to do, and my father was encouraging me to to stay uh, out in California and continue to follow that dream that I had to be, you know, a surf photographer working for the surf magazine, traveling around the world. But, you know, um, you, you can always hear in somebody's voice what, you know, no matter how much they're encouraging you, th they want you and need you around. And then uh, certainly my mother did because it was inevitable that he was going to pass. Right. And so I went back to Texas. And uh, one thing, you know, life, you know, next thing you know, I, I uh, met the love of my uh, life. Uh, uh started a business, uh, had a child. Uh, I was very fortunate that my daughter got to even go to the same schools that I did. So there was all that continuity of life that I just did not want to uh, walk away from. And um, I always knew 
that I wanted to come back around to this and start shooting again. And then once I got to a point in my life where I was free enough to do it and, and my daughter has grown up, uh, I've, I've started to shoot again and, and, and enjoy it. Uh, they say you can't go back, back, but uh, I'm reliving it and enjoying it now more than I ever did. Um, we end up in Santa Barbara usually uh, every January when it's always good. Um, well, no, it's never good in January. Sorry, I misspoke there. Uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> it's never good ever. <laughs> <laughs> never. Uh, but, uh, and uh, it's just amazing. Uh, uh, to this day, I do not surf much anymore. But to this day when I'm shooting and it's really good and I'm shooting somebody like Bobby Martinez or one of the Kaufman brothers uh, right. uh, and some of the new, some of the up-and-coming local guys uh, of, of this era, uh, it's just I, I get the same exciting feeling that I was shooting uh, Tommy or Davy Smith or whomever back in the day. Uh, yeah. uh, it's just it's I, I just love doing it. It's one of the most exciting uh this this period where the book takes place one of the most exciting points in my life and uh and now this point where i'm shooting uh at this day and age is just every bit as exciting you know will it be a book 40 years from now i doubt it <laughs> but uh, you know the whole time you know there was no book plan when i was shooting 40 years ago it was just being in the moment and loving it and capturing right. and that's that's what it's all about but it um, does feel oh go on sorry Oh, I, I was I was sad to leave. I did want to go on and, and travel and do the world tour and, and and you know all through the eighties and nineties and who knows where it would end. And it, it, a strange story is is when I uh, met Kelly the first time back in uh, when he was a little kid, and I saw that you know this guy has this is like the next Tommy Kern is how we looked at it back then. He wasn't Kelly Slater at that point. He was the next Tommy Kern. Uh, I was like, what am I doing? I need to start following this guy now. You know. And, uh, you know, again, life, life has its way of, you know, dictating some things. And, um, and I was glad to have caught that very beginning part, which is, which I do include as an epilogue in the book of Kelly Slater. Yeah. I love that part actually. And, and, you know, the sliding doors moments, right? You could have done this, you could have yeah. done that, but it yeah. does feel like uh, certainly, and, and sort of beautifully laid out in, in the book that kind of cosmic, that kind of fairy tale, and not not intentionally, not overwrought, but like there was kind of a momentum pulling you in these ways. And and that Kelly Slater epilogue of he was probably still Robert at the time, you know, <laughs> like um yeah, coming to South Padre Island where you first saw Tommy and and being able to identify him with all your background and that real full circle moment is beautifully kind of written and, and depicted there. Yeah, no, it's it, it's uh, pretty much a hundred percent how it it kind of happened, and um, uh, you know, I I don't know Kelly as an adult, but I can tell you, Kelly as that little kid that appears in the photos in that book was a cool little mm -hmm. kid, you know. He mm -hmm. was, uh, and that's the you know, from not knowing him as an adult, that's the Kelly I always remember, you know. Uh, right. And you could just tell that he was going to have you know good command of what was going to come his way. And, and, mm -hmm. and he had Tommy ahead of him, you know, uh, whereas Tommy right. did not have a, you know, a Tommy ahead of him. And so uh, that's probably where the, the big difference was for that. Plus, they're different people. Uh, but, sure. But talent wise, uh, you know, that, that you just nowadays the kids start surfing so early and right. especially with wave pools that they're so f mm. their skill and, and their level rises so quickly so high that you're watching kids you know do these flips and pulls that are like 11 and you're just like right. wow you know and they're connecting maneuvers but you know so it's it's even the difference between tommy and kelly like at 14 you could see the progression of the sport and of the equipment and how they surf right. different but that's not really what we're talking about. what we're talking about is this raw talent that transcends all that and when you see mm -hmm. it you know it you know it there's it's doesn't matter how many kids are ripping. When you see that one kid, that you know what? You know, I think it's harder now because yeah. there are so many uh, good kids. But when you get those, when you get those Tommys or Kellys, you usually know it at a very young age. Right. That, that makes a ton of sense. You, know, you talked about how you still come out and you shoot the West Coast, and and it 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 still stirs up 
you know, the same feelings you had when you were shooting at, at, at the points that were chronicled in Shaping Surf History. And you said it unlikely in 40 years there's going to be another book. But going back to what we talked about right in the upfront, you know, those conditions, um, maybe sort of cosmic conditions that came into play with the people and the place and the waves and the equipment. It was an organic kind of coming together that created these years that you were there for and that you were integral to. Do you see that being possible in 2023 or moving forward? Just because of what we talked about before, not no one on earth really naturally having that time and space that existed back then, you know, everyone's so busy, but do you think that, that whether it's in surfing or somewhere else, that, that, that kind of magic formula of ingredients can exist for, for something? So if you look at all the components of that time, uh, the, the, what really made it all work uh, was the El Nino uh, surf of 83. Mm. And uh, just how good the surf was most of those four years. Uh, I, I think when you have surf that good and that consistent in a place uh, like the 805, uh, you know, anything can happen. Now, whether it's going to be the same players, uh, type of players, the. Mm. You know where can surfboards go now? That's is is radical of a change as it was back then. You know, it, it norm. You know, it's kind of like you. They say, what's going to get you is not what you're worried about. It's something from left field. You know, it's kind of that kind of thing. Mm. Whatever that next thing is going to be is not what you're thinking it's going to be. It's going to be something. Right. And the point is just to you know, as a photographer from that perspective, the point is just to be there be open-minded and shooting the second you go especially around surfing with something specific in mind you want to shoot you're going to be really disappointed because it just doesn't work that way right you know you can send writers to go do articles but you can't you know you have four days to do this article you can't do that with photography you know it just has to kind of happen then you come back with the goods and then you decide what you're going to do with it and i think that's the same way you know like if if 20 uh january 2024 ends up being this big El Nino year, it's going to be what it's going to be. And then you see what you have right. afterwards kind of a thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. We'll bleep out the January part just for your and my benefit, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we did put out some feelers uh, for questions from the Instagram community at the lineup pod for, uh, for yourself. We got a bunch back, but we've, uh, we've oh, really? whittled them down to, to three. Um, first question is from at Jake underscore M underscore Lee, who asks, what was your most memorable Tom Curran experience? Or what is, I suppose. Yeah, it's not over. Most memorable Tom Curran experience. Um, well, first of all, Tom, he, he was in, he's incredibly witty, incredibly funny. Uh, the, the whole time, our whole gang, we were constantly having fun. Constantly playing practical jokes in each other. Um, uh, did we ever get mad at each other? Uh, you, you know, it, it sometimes. I, I remember there was this time at Super Tubes where Tom, uh, I talked Tom to go in there. It was on a it was on a south, which is really not a good swell direction for that spot. But whenever everything kind of lines up, you kind of be there. And it was in the afternoon. And Tom gets just this insane wave. And I'm looking through my camera and there's a little button on the motor drive that turns and locks the button. And there's no lock for the lock. So it just inadvertently had switched on lock. And I'm looking through my viewfinder trying to push down the button and it won't push. And through my viewfinder, I'm seeing cover shots, center spread, you know, all these things you dream right. about as a <laughs> right. surf photographer on this big, round, beautiful California barrel. And because it was it had too much south in it, it, it it's a really hard place to take a wipeout uh, uh, super tubes. Uh, it's it's on the rocks. It, it comes out of deep water, and it, it, Tommy got totally crunched at the end. And he comes up and he kind of looks back at me, like this whole it, it just just like he got worked and his whole experience was just awful. And he's like looked at me like it was all my fault and kind of like you better have gotten the shot. And uh, I, you know, I was everything about that was so disheartening. Um, for some reason, that look of Tommy looking back at me like, "You better have gotten that shot because I'm never going <laughs> to come here again." And having had that happen, uh, for some reason, that always sticks in my mind. I don't think we ever, 
you know, I, I think it was all good. I just, there was so much surf. We were having so much fun. We were just kids, you know, like I say in the book, unscripted, just, just being surfers that it, I, it was yeah. all good. But, you know, so the only thing that really stood out was like, was like that negative thing. I'll never forget that look he gave back at me. I, <laughs> When he came up from behind that way, you know, it's like waist high water and, and he's standing in waist high water, just looking like, you know, he got ran over by a Mack truck and looking at me and, <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't have the shot, you know, you know, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. The, the next questions maybe you're related, maybe not to this, but the spot, but it's from at Matson Colbert who asks, uh, tell us about the film roles you lost at Super Tubes, never to be found again in the 80s. I don't know if that rings a bell. So I think what he's, I think uh, that would have been it. So, oh, right. Okay. There you go. So, so not the, the, with cameras, there, there was like, you know, like there's 101 ways to die in the West. You know, there's 101 ways to lose your film. <laughs> you know, there was getting your sure. camera submerged. Uh, I had the beginning of 83. I, uh, it was a very lackluster day at a place called Halama, and I decided to climb up on the cliff. And it's like an 80 foot cliff. And when you get up there, what looks like little like knee high grass is these big bushes. And the only place you could walk was right along the edge of the 80 foot cliff with nothing but you know vertical drop and rocks. And I managed to shimmy over, you know, and you had to, I had to go up in this goalie and then shimmy over in front of the break where Davy Smith was surfing, just trying to get a different angle. There, no, you got to remember, there are no drones back then. You had to actually climb up somewhere like that. And I set my tripod up, tripod with my big 650 lens, just on an angle where I had to put the the third leg. Uh, out towards the the drop so it wouldn't fall and I kind of set it up there and I put my hands next to and I moved my hands next to the camera and it wasn't any movement and I reached around and and to go get the film out of the bag and as I turned back around the camera was starting to to lean over and fall and for me to have even like gone like that I would have been over the cliff. I was that precariously balanced. Right, right. <laughs> and I just sat out there and watched my camera and my lens and everything fall and bounce off the rocks and explode and everything. And I just, you know, there's that moment, that one moment of realization, you know, nowadays we say command Z, you know, can I go back to that right. time, you know, <laughs> two minutes earlier and not have done this. So I got back down the cliff. I, I climbed down, um, covered all my stuff the the camera smashed the pieces the lens looked had a little dent in it and then the uh motor drive looked fine so i really wasn't familiar with how insurance worked at that age and i called the insurance guy up and he said okay what needs to be replaced i said well the camera's gone he goes okay replace it what else i said well i think the motor drive's fine so you know i felt guilty you know i didn't want to like like honest with the insurance yeah, I was being yeah. way, way too honest so so I got a new camera, motor drive, everything worked. Um, the lens, I swear, is sharp, was sharper after that drop than it was before. <laughs> it was just that Century 650, wow. the equipment we used back then was crude, but it was amazing sharp. So then the El Nino hits, and there's so much, there was so much surf that I shot, which at that time was an incredible amount of film without taking it to be developed. I shot 13 rolls. Mm. And I would just stack it up on the shelf in my bedroom, just waiting for the day where I could take it in to be developed, which would go off to Kodak and come back a week later and look at each slide one at a time, 36 shots times 13. Uh, and just all these, the perfect sand spit. Per there was a day at Rincon that was inside, the very inside of the cove was 10 feet and was like Woody Woodworth, if you know what that reference is, perfect. Yeah. And this wow. guy was just taking off where everybody was kicking off, getting these just perfect ways where I was at the top of the freeway looking down. Uh, there was there, there was uh, super tubes, there was, uh, did I say sand spit? Uh, might as well say yeah, it yeah. twice. Uh, sure. All, there's all the, everybody. And I went to uh, the film store to pick up the film on the day it came. And there's this National Geographic photographer there shooting on assignment doing, shooting tide pools in the area. And he remarked, he goes, he goes, that's how you shoot. You shoot lots of film. These guys that shoot one film, you know, roll of film and, and then don't shoot any more film. They go, they'll never learn anything. You got to shoot a lot of film. So I was so proud of myself. 
and I went to pick up the box of film. The slides came in a box, and the first one was really light. And uh, I thought, okay, there was one roll that I shot about eight shots, and a and a big set was coming, so I wanted a full thirty six shots. So I I took the roll out and put a, and reloaded the full roll, and I went to the next box, and it was really light. So light means if there if the images didn't come out, they don't put mounts on them. So you just mm -hmm. have the film without the 36 individual shots with the cardboard mounts around each shot, which would make the box of slides much heavier. So I said, well, sure. maybe there was a second roll that I just shot halfway through. And then the third, then the fourth, and they were all, uh, they were all empty, uh, no oh, shots, no. because the motor drive that I did not want to turn in, had the pin wasn't turning the film. And so it was just shooting the same piece of film. So out of all that stuff, I probably, there were probably for some reason, 10 shots that came out uh, that ex were exposed fine. And a couple of them are in the book. But that is probably, to this day, when I talk about it, uh, I, I still get a bad feeling in my stomach. <laughs> Well, so, then that means the National Geographic photographer was right. You learned a lot shooting all those. <laughs> that's very, very. <laughs> Very weird of you to point that out. <laughs> good story. Good story. So, uh, last question that we uh, we called from the Instagram community is from uh, at uh, Mia Fuku, who asks, why was it important for you to write and share this book today? I think you've talked about it a little bit, but maybe summary for, for our uh, Instagram community. I... I you know, I told you that I'm, I'm getting ready to launch my website and I was looking for something that personified, you know, what I felt as a photographer. And um, one of the things I say right when you when you open up the website is um, I can't remember the words that I wrote exactly, but basically to the to the um, speaks to I don't think I I ever really shot a photo to capture it, I always shot photos to share. And mm -hmm. and as a photographer, you want to see your stuff in print, whether it's a it's a gallery fine art print or it's in a magazine or it's in a book, and you want to share those. That's that's the whole reason you shoot is to share that image. Uh, and I think a book, a coffee table book of a, of an era such that I was lucky enough to experience uh, is the ultimate way to share that. Great answer. Uh, thank you to the Instagram community at the lineup pod. We are now to our very final segment. Uh, this is the lightning round. So we have uh, 10 questions. These are the same 10 questions we asked everyone uh, for you to answer as quickly as you can. <clears throat> First question. If you personally could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Uh, seven two single rounded pin. Coffee or tea? Coffee used to be tea, but definitely coffee now. <laughs> Burrito or pizza? Pizza. Last book you read? Shaping Surf History. Best surf film ever? Uh, Searching for Tom Curran. That is a common answer. What is one wave you never have to go back to? One wave I never have to go back to. Um, Bermuda Beach. Very obscure place. If you only personally get to surf one wave for the rest of your life and you can dream cast this, empty lineup, perfect offshore, whatever it is, what wave would that be for you? Uh, Rincon is left. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, best person to share a lineup with? Uh, anybody that loves being out in the water as much and surfing as much as uh, I do. Uh, worst person to share a lineup with? Uh, anybody who hates <laughs> being out in the water but is out there anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, last one. Uh, finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by... Uh, having pizza, drinking coffee, surfing with buddies. Uh, what, are, what were the other questions? <laughs> uh, uh, now that's very witty. Now he's now he's talking, but and being you know, Jimmy, at perfect rink on oh, shooting uh, this winter. 
I love it. Jimmy, this has been a true pleasure having you on the podcast. Everyone should check out Shaping Surf History when it comes out in early September. We'll make sure we put the uh, links to where they can find it in the show notes. Uh, Jimmy, look forward to meeting in person uh, when you come out here for your uh, book tour in a couple of weeks. And yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah, no, I loved being on. Thanks. It was a lot of fun.